Okay, so we're about you to get going again. So intro slide is the same as the last session. If you weren't there, well, that's me. I'm presuming that I have largely a subset of the previous audience. Because uh, quick outline of the talk. Um, first of all, qu very quick summary of what is a contract. That was the subject of the previous talk. And from there, we're going to go into the idea of how contracts can actually be expressed fairly directly in some parts of the C++ language, and whether or not that helps us simplify how we document our code, and if we make those assumptions, some of those implications. So I'm going to start with my basic definition. What is a contract? And for the purpose of this talk, Contract, as I said before, is an exchange of promises between an API supplier, because now we're just talking about C++, we're going to assume you're supplying a C++ API, and their clients. Now, the client promises to satisfy all the documented preconditions, so that will be our term of art to say this is the client side of the guarantees they need to give when making the call, and the supplier will then guarantee their post conditions that they will deliver assuming all those preconditions have been satisfied. And we run into this with the assumption that contracts should be stable after release. Uh, it's a point that seems fairly simple and it's going to have some meta notions as we come through some of the implications of the whole idea of expressing contracts in code. And as we spoke about at the end of the last session, there's safe way, relatively safe ways that you can revise a contract after it has been published with minimal risk, but rarely with no risk. And some of the assumptions that people will start making on the things we're talking about goes into some gray areas that you should be aware of when you're thinking in terms of stability. So, which comes back to my basic question here. How much of a contract is implicit in a function declaration or a class definition? If I have the signature void swap int ref x, int ref y, what assumptions can I legitimately make about this code in the absence of any other published information? There's already looking at this code an implicit contract. So one of those implicit contracts is I have a function called swap. Um, it takes exactly two arguments that must be L values. These are things that the language of the compiler is going to handle for me, so I don't need to go out of my way to unduly perhaps document some of these. I'm going to assume X and Y refer to valid objects. I'm not going to need to make that requirement when I document my version of a contract, because if X and Y are bound to invalid objects, you already left the well-defined behavior of the language before you ever got around to making my call. So I do not need to document that when you call me, the things you give me are valid according to their own rules. And references come with some basic guarantees in the language. And one of those is I'm referring to an in lifetime object or function that in this case we've got integers so they will be an in lifetime integer. Um, potentially I guess I could be having to deal with uninitialized integers and that, yeah, maybe I may got myself a bit too, too cocky here, but yeah, generally speaking, if I have a reference, I'm going to assume there's a valid object at the other end of that reference, and it's the burden to document otherwise if I'm going to handle uninitialized hints. There's no result because it returns void, so when I'm just thinking in the more abstract, I can't auto equals and expect that to bind there. I can't suddenly come back and change this and start saying, ha ha, my function gives an int and or if I had a function that returns such, I couldn't be able to change it in that direction. And because I say nothing with exception specifications, I have to assume that this function might throw by throwing an exception. 
I'm making big assumptions just from the naming what it's likely to do, and I would be shocked if it threw an exception. But I can't make any implicit assumptions on the code that we see here. But when I come around to documenting my function, I have to at least guarantee the semantics of the function that I'm going to exchange the values of x and y. That is probably sufficient guarantee. Though if we really wanted to be serious about saying it can't throw, that would do no harm to provide that as an additional guarantee. So my principle going into this talk is that not every aspect of a function needs to be documented in the English language contract I was talking about in the previous session. The unspecified parts of the contract are what gives us freedom to evolve moving forward. So, um, if you do not document explicitly what you mean with these signatures though, even down to the nitty gritty of some other language implications here, clients will make assumptions about that undocumented gray area when they're reading your functions and signatures. Sometimes those are the implications you want them to take. If you think there's a chance they will misread those implications, even though the signature looks good, that's where you should jump in and provide additional documentation. Which is the bullet that I've just put up. So. If we look in C++ 98, going back in the day, there's a few features here that the language gives us relatively direct support for expressing important notions that we would want to write into our contracts, certain guarantees about the properties of types and how you can use them, the fact we have types at all. And these are a concise way of expressing unambiguously, perhaps, some of the notions of our contracts. So we want to take full advantage of those to hopefully produce simpler contracts. So we'll start with the first one. What does const indicate? Well, it actually could indicate three different things. If we look at the first case, it says very clearly, um, x is a constant value, it can never change. That's a very nice thing to rely on, and it's very helpful for the compiler to be able to rely on this as well. And it's very hard to violate and break, certainly within the rules of the language. So I don't need to, Wax lyric is like having a comment that says increments i. I don't need to say anything to a user to, say, to know that if this thing can't change, we've got some set of properties we can already assume about it. On the other hand, if I have a function that takes const, a, a, a type by const reference, what I'm saying is the function I'm calling is not going to change that value. Which is you know, nice for me as the caller, I've got that guarantee from the code I'm calling. But when I'm the implementer of that function, I can't assume that that function might not have its value changed out underneath me. Of course, for that to be happening, it's likely to be occurring through multi-threaded code. Maybe we've got a synchronization issue. But fundamentally, I have a constant view on something that might change. In particular, if I've got aliasing within my own function call, I might have a multiple reference into what that object is referencing. It might actually change underneath me. So, I've got some assumptions here. Perhaps I need to put additional aliasing assumptions if I'm going to rely on this thing not changing or threading assumptions. But we have some strong notions still that const references giving me some useful information. And finally, if I've got a const qualified member function, I know that if I call that function, it's not going to change the state of that object unless people are cheating with mutable. So it's kind of a guarantee. It's a function that gives me permission to call functions through to const references, so the language can enforce some of those rules and apply contract validation on my behalf. So this is just looking at the basic tools of C++ and trying to throw the language of contracts over them so to try to see how we can easily grow out code using contracts. The other example we just looked at was pass by reference, I get to make the assumption 
that you have given me a reference to a valid object. Otherwise, you already entered undefined behavior land before you got to my function. So I don't need to worry about that reference referring to something invalid. The program was out of contract before you got to me, so it doesn't matter what my contract said, the program's already undefined. Conversely, if I pass a pointer, I have far more undefined behaviors to worry about. Um, the pointer could be pointing to an expired or an invalid object, and it's only when I dereference the pointer within my function that the undefined behavior occurs. So by passing a pointer, I move the point of invoking the undefined behavior to within my function. So I do have to worry about that concern and document it to say, hey, I'm going to dereference this pointer, don't give me a bad pointer. If I'm going to do is copy and move it around, I might not need to worry about requiring that guarantee on the caller. Um, there's also a common invalid pointer value that is the null pointer value. And you'll find code bases tend to perhaps do different things with this one. There's a common convention that functions can't handle null pointer values unless they say otherwise. And there's other code bases that think, no, the null pointer is a perfectly good value. If I don't tell you I can't handle null pointer values, it's my responsibility, since I didn't say anything, to test that you didn't give me a null pointer value and handle that special case. And at this point, we're leaving the world of what the language can give you, and we're into convention. So it's important to understand the conventions of the libraries you're dealing with and how they are documenting their own contracts. Another obvious part of contracts in a language is types themselves are fundamentally a contract. You have a certain bundle of properties and operations you can assume when you have a type. It gives you a vocabulary you can just drop into your functions that brings with it an awful lot of implicit guarantees and contracts that come from that type, because otherwise it'd be impossible to document everything in every function everywhere. This is how we, this is our main vehicle for simplifying contracts. We use types and trust the properties of those types as they go through. Type violations are going to be caught by the compiler if I try and use types in manners that are incompatible. So, you know, if I, the notion here is I'm trying to read my slide up here, I should be reading it down here. What is the thing about copyability and convertibility? But yeah, certain properties of types, if they're copyable, if they're convertible between each other, you know these properties about the types themselves, and just putting them into the function signature brings those guarantees with you. Can I call this function with this value or this object? Well, if it's a conversion between that and the argument type, I don't need to spell that out. That's already buried into the language. Which brings us to the notion of user-defined types, how we can now extend the language forward rather than just using the built-in scalar types. Classes and unions allow us to assemble much larger, more interesting and complicated types with their own set of constraints and guarantees. And again, just coming back to general good software principles that have stood the test of time, a helpful principle is a single class should have a single responsibility. And you build larger classes out of Simple things. At some point, you might feel that the complexity of having so many classes to manage requires some other simple organizing scheme. But in general, single class, single responsibility will go a long way to giving you comprehensible, reasonable code in the manner that you can reason about it. Not that it's unreasonable not to do these things. And again, enumerations and arrays give us you know, different aspects of how I can play around with the fundamental types in a language to give additional information for contracts without having to get too buried in specifying a lot of these details. So use them where appropriate. Constructors are one of the key components to the user defined aspect of the C++ type system that I'm going to use to ensure that my contracts are being managed and enforced for me. The constructor is my opportunity to say, when I'm dealing with this type, it's the constructor's responsibility to guarantee that that object is now in a state 
that has satisfied all its invariants. It's my job to document what those invariants are. You need to know what you get from a con and document what state that constructor is going to put the object into. But the object doesn't exist before the construction. If the construction fails, typically I'm going to throw an exception and never get the object alive. So if a constructor completes, it's my responsibility to make sure honoring the language side of the contract here, my, my class is now in a usable state. But this now guarantees objects are always in usable states. And that allows us to make all those assumptions as we pass these objects through our APIs that unless there's spelled out states that certain operations have preconditions on them, I can always assume my object is in a good state. And I don't need to further document that as clients of code with objects of these types coming in. Now, one of the idioms you might get in other languages is the notion of partial constructors. Partial constructors really don't work well for C++ because that leaves you with an object that's now living and breathing, but it's not in a valid state. It's breathing very raspily. Uh, I strongly urge you not to get into the notion of partial constructors and two-phase construction. There is a notion once we have C++11 that we might like to have partial constructors that the public constructors can delegate to. In which case you might make your partial constructor a private constructor, but it's still a surprising idiom that I think is going to fool enough people, and especially when you come around to the next slide on destructors, you now have to handle partially constructed objects. It's usually not a great idea. So I mentioned it in passing, mostly to say, don't do that. And I'm always nervous when I put a don't do that on a slide that people, oh, there's this thing I didn't know I could not do. Now I will go and do it. Don't do that, please. Um, the other key aspect for use define types is destructors. I've got two key properties here. The first is they're going to guarantee when my object is destroyed, it's my responsibility as I implement that destructor to say, okay, I have a living, breathing object. I'm now going to release all the resources that object has been managing, and now I guarantee that my program is going to be yeah, leak free. And this is the other essential aspect of wrapping components and knowing how we can use types safely. It's, in terms of my previous slide, destructors are acting as our post condition guarantees. The post condition is I'm it's my tool to leave my object, my system, in a cleaned up state. There's another interesting property you can get from destructors, which is using classes as control flow. Because a destructor is always going to be called regardless of whether a function exits through a return, an early return, a late return, or an exception, sometimes it's useful to embed cleanup logic for a function or some other aspect directly as a piece of logic in a local object that's got a destructor that just says, I'm guaranteed I'll run that cleanup as I exit. Though it's unusual that you're not actively managing another resource from a class that came with its own constructor to do that work in the first place. And the whole notion of constructors and destructors wrap up together to give us a notion that has been referred to as RAII. Resource acquisition is initialization. It's a idiom we got from Biana who always complains he's not very good at coming up with memorable acronyms, but it's a, a tried and tested technique of the C++ community. The whole point of using this is that our resources are now never unmanaged. And that's part of our contract, that we can see these types going through the type system. There's the implicit invariants allow us to reason about our contract without having to dictate too much about ma micromanaging all those resources. And the principle is resource acquisition is initialization. Always wrap any resource acquisition operation in a constructor. Have your class manage a single resource and you build your larger aggregations of classes out of the smaller ones, and that guarantees acquisition and cleanup never end up racing each other and you end up with strange corner cases. 
Once I have my objects this way, we now have the ability to transfer and move objects around, exchanging state, and these things are always now stay in these managed types. So it's the type that carries that exchange logic of the contract, rather than me having to write lots of fine-grained contracts that are explaining how state is moving between different parts of the system all the time. I can simply say these objects transfer around and the state is managed. Greatly simplifies reasoning about contracts. Another key contract support in C++ 98 is the notion of virtual functions. Now, I don't want to get deep into the notion of Liskov substitution, how to use substitutability correctly. There's an awful lot of design discussion at this point. And it's exactly that, it's design discussion. Whereas I'm trying to focus on this is a mechanical tool that just allows us to express certain kinds of customization within a language. So, what do virtual functions give us? Well, we're going to document our virtual function. So that gives our client the ability to make certain assumptions that we've contracted. But it also allows them now to plug in their own extensions that implement that contract themselves. So this is a way almost of injecting contracts back into our clients to say, I want you to give me something that satisfies this contract. I've implemented my side here, but you've now got to implement this thing yourself that also honors the contract. So it gives us a two-way communication. Well, the nice things here, of course, is you know, the compiler is going to ensure that the signatures match correctly, allowing for covariant return types. So if these things don't match, we'll get various errors coming out of the compiler. Always nice to use the compiler for our benefit. The key point is, once you're into the realm of virtual functions, your ability to specify a contract becomes a lot more important because both client, client and supplier are now relying on both sides of these contracts. And abstract base classes are an extension of the notion of virtual functions. This is just a common idiom to say, we've distilled our contract down to as simple as it can, as primitive as it can be. I've not actually got an implementation behind this function. All I've got is the contract, and this is my mechanism to pass you a contract that you either give me something that fulfills that and I can use it, or I mean, we, we can plug in these extension points quite handily. And my example here comes from C++17, the PMR memory resource in order to better support allocation. But as we start getting into the realm of the abstract base classes, classes in general, there's still a burden that we have to, con to document how the contracts of use of the class as a whole, the interoperations between the, 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 uh, the operations of the class, too many operations there, um, relate to each other. And my final aspect of C++ 98 is the assert macro that we inherited from C. This is moving much more onto the other side of the equation to say this is a tool to help us enforce contracts at runtime in the client side. So they are not evident to the callers of the code, but they are still a very useful tool in expressing contracts through our code, especially for the maintainers reading that code. Um, they give us a chance to instrument our code with the ability to say, I can build in one mode where my, I'm going to perform these checks and try to validate the preconditions that you give me. And I can build in a nice release mode where all that code just simply vanishes so there's no actual performance runtime cost of it at the expense of I'm not going to catch your errors and the system's then going to, going to undefined behavior if you've lied to me. So it's a support tool. It's a really nifty tool when you're testing. Um, I've noticed that in some development communities, they really like wide contracts and they distrust things like assert that are going to kill their program. That's not what they want happening at runtime. But in general, this is the best we have with C++ 98 and C. And um, 
when I first started using this, it was shocking how many bugs it found in the first two, three weeks, and how few it started finding after that. You surprisingly, the, the, the idioms that you have in your code that you're not aware that you've got, this, this kind of tool quickly flushes them out. Um, hopefully speaking, preaching to the choir on that one by now. Then we move on towards C++11. And we get um, a, a more extended variety of language features that can help us trying to express our contracts more directly in code. And, and as I say, you're gonna start making your assumptions about what we're writing here. So a classic one, we added the override keyword. So this is a way to say, yes, I'm actually forcing a contract on my base class. I am trying to override a function that matches this signature. Unless I find that in one of my base classes, this is now an enforcement technique to say, yes, I will catch that contract violation, and the compiler will tell me about it. And as a client reading that code, I know that there's some additional documentation I need to go and read in the base class that might not be all entirely described here. The other aspect we have with virtual functions is the notion of final. And this lets readers know that at this point, nobody else is allowed to further modify this operation. So when I'm reasoning about it, I can now reason about it as if it were static dispatch rather than dynamic dispatch, which is a nice thing as a reader of the code. It's a really nice thing if I'm a compiler of the code. And we can apply this either at the whole class level, saying you know, users are no longer allowed to derive from this class, which is an interesting kind of contract. It doesn't play as well with C++ as some other languages, as C++ often goes with the notion of mixing classes to build more aggregate functionality. And if you've got a final class, you can't wrap that so easily. But final on virtual functions is certainly a nice way to give the guarantee that yes, I'm at the end of the chain I expect, and you can reason about me much more easily now. One of the more intriguing parts of C++11 that to this day I still find people having interesting discussions about it. I'm ho hoping again that we've got a, a room that largely knows the notion of move semantics. If I say move semantics, is everyone happy with what they think I'm talking about? Well, I'm not getting that many hands going up, so I'll take this one at a reasonable pace then. So move semantics are basically a library convention, even though I'm putting them in this language support part, that are built around a new language feature called R value references. So with the C11 compiler, the compiler itself can't enforce that convention for you, but it's giving you the language facility that you can build this exchange around. And the principle is, if I have passed an R value reference, I'm going to assume that what is on the other end of that is either an R value, it's an object that's about to expire, so nobody will need the state in that object after my function has finished executing because I'm bound to a temporary that's going away. And if it's not really an R value because somebody has lied to me with a dastardly cast, they want me to make the assumption that it's about to go away in the same way. That's the notion of the convention. So given that I know that nobody can rely on the contents of that object after I have executed, I'm actually quite at liberty to change the state of that object in any way I want. Nobody's going to be able to observe those changes, by and large. So that allows me to efficiently transfer and steal resources from that object rather than having to perhaps make expensive copies. This is the fundamental assumption of move semantics. But I have to also live with the assumption that if you didn't give me an R value, if you lied to me with those funny casts that come out of standard move, then the object that sits around might actually end up living beyond that function call. What you've told me is you don't care about the state of that object, but I'm not allowed to violate that object's invariance. 
And this is where move semantics gets a bit controversial with some folks. If I want to have the object left in any random state, it might not be valid to do any operation on that type. What I'm saying is that type has really weak invariants. And as long as I document those crazy weak invariants that say, you know, if you've called move on this, if you've moved from this object, all bets are off. All you can do is destroy me. That's a reasonable thing to do. I, well, it's a viable thing to do. I don't think it's a particularly reasonable thing to do. I don't like contracts that are that weak. But in terms of when I'm writing my end of the code, I'm going to have to assume that anything, any object I'm stealing state from is going to persist beyond that call in some shape or form. At least the destructor has to run if it was a true temporary. And other folks might still want to use that object afterwards. So the invariants hold if there's conditional invariants. So I've got something like a vector and I've moved all the data out of the vector. I can't call front safely afterwards because I don't know if the vector you've given me back is empty. But I can call the empty function. And once I know whether or not that vector is empty, it's reliable that I can call front or not. So that's the essence of move semantics. It's simply saying, okay, I'm making, taking inference that you don't care about the state of this object after I'm done with it, but I still need to leave you with a valid object. I'm just taking my opportunities to get my state into the, the state I want as efficiently as possible. Another neat guarantee that comes with a language is no except. We have the option of saying, you know, my function does not throw exceptions. I have the option of putting no except on my function to let everyone really know that rather than, or as well as writing it in a plain English contract. This is a guarantee that the compiler can rely on. It will enforce it at runtime. So there may be a runtime cost to putting this here as the compiler now has to potentially catch exceptions in order to terminate when you violated your end of the deal if you did try throwing through there. It may or may not be able to optimize away if it can reason and see, well, all the operations you're calling can't throw, so I know there's nothing to catch. But in principle, there's a runtime call that we want, runtime check that we would like to see optimized away. This is one of those awkward cases, unusual cases, where by contractually put it, putting this contract into the code, we can also reflect on this property because there's a no except operator. So there's more interesting questions here beyond just, I'm giving you a contract that says when you call me, you know I've now got the no throw guarantee, which is a really handy guarantee to have about operations. Uh, you can actually query about that and um, in generic code, you know, templates you'll therefore dispatch code accordingly, saying, well, if I know that this can't throw, I might be able to do a more efficient set of operations. But do think carefully before placing this freely throughout your code. Because what you're doing is you're writing a contract that says, this code can never throw. Not only now as I'm writing it today, but as I evolve this code into the future and maintain it, and it goes through any other future changes, it's a binding guarantee into the future as well. So if that guarantee is good, use it. But if that guarantee is not something you want to commit to yet, even though you put it into your English contract, you've got this freedom to play around with it a little. In particular, think carefully about putting this on what I was calling in the previous session, narrow contract. Because if you put this on the function signature, it means your ability to diagnose and help your callers when they call you out of contract, has now been constrained by the compiler. If you just document you don't throw exceptions, you're perfectly at liberty to throw an exception if someone calls you out of contract. If you put this on a signature, the compiler is going to enforce that rule for you. Now, if you don't care about that, it's a great tool. If you do care about how you're trying to diagnose and help folks out once they go outside the contract, that's a cons consideration. Constexper is another interesting feature that has implications for contracts. 
provides a guarantee that the function itself can be computed entirely at compile time, which among other things that I didn't actually get on the slide, means it's what we would call side effect free. So it's not going to have any effect on the system that persists beyond the evaluation of the function call itself. And once you know you have side effect free code, that's really handy in a variety of contexts, especially in concurrency, for example. And we also have a second important property comes out of this, that the contract we want to enforce that certain types, such as standard mutex, really need to be burned in before main is running. We don't want race conditions as we're trying to create some of these types. And const expert is a tool that allows us to put that contractually into our type. You can use this type and it will be constructed before main starts without actually running any code. It will just basically come into being in this perfect ideal const expert evaluated state. Um, the final part I have on the C++ 11 side of expressing contracts in code is one of those wonderful joys that came with C++ 9803, but really took flight with C++ 11, which is the notion that I can play games with templates to cause them to fail to match in name lookup and overload resolution if certain constraints are not satisfied on the properties of those template parameters that are being deduced. Hence we end up with this wonderful funky acronym, substitution failure is not an error. Uh, we can't blame Bjarne for this one. And um, we've still not found a better term for it. Uh, so again, this is a way of expressing constraints directly in code, which is often a good thing. Uh, we now have standard type traits that make some of these expressions much easier to handle. So we've got is constructible, is convertible, is invocable in C++ 17. As I said, a failure to satisfy this constraint is an indication that yes, I'm going to, if I try and use a type that doesn't satisfy these constraints, I'm likely going to get an error saying I could not find the function. But it will fail in a friendly manner, so if another function with that same name does allow this thing to be accepted, we can go on and find that without putting an eager, eager error in there. Um, if we call it directly by instantiating the template, though, it's still going to be an error. It will cause that to fail to compile. So we're now requiring certain properties of our types directly in our signature which potentially means that, you know, that's our documentation. We've put that constraint into the code. Uh, we have in C++ 711 standard library, standard enable if is a convenient tool for packaging up how we can express a lot of these constraints and trigger this finite condition much more easily than trying to play all these games by hand in code, which is truly expert domain as opposed to modestly expert domain. Uh, my own personal opinion of this is that lots of complicated SWIDI constraints are generally much harder to read than actually the plain English contracts trying to say the same thing. So, yep, we can put this into our code. It means that the compilers help us enforce our contracts, but it might not be the best form of documentation, so we can redundantly specify it in English. It then just gives the if the English and the implementation are in, co are in conflict, which one was correct? And that's just your classic bug report. Did I get the contract correct, or did I get the implementation correct? And as I was saying in the previous session, changing contracts is generally a lot harder than changing implementations. Assuming people have written to the code correctly, and I'm, my battery is running out, so excuse me while I remember to actually plug in the notebook. You know, I brought this for a reason. And the last tool we have with C++ um, 11 is static assert. Uh, 
And this is just another tool that lets us validate and check our contracts in the same way that a cert checks at runtime. This allows us a compile time check, mostly within our implementations, so it's not as visible to the end user that they're trying to call us correctly with the right types of information. Static Assert does have the ability to leak out to more public facing aspects, such as at a class scope, and might be deemed as a form of documentation there, but mostly this is a contract enforcement tool rather than a contract implicit documentation tool. So do I have any questions on, boom, wrong way. The C++, 03, and 11 tools that I'm mostly assuming we're familiar with before I move on. Okay. I'm afraid I was slightly gambling, it's gonna take a bit longer, and I've not done, whoops. Too much detail as an in-depth guide on concepts because there's going to be much better talks that have actually got a whole talk given to them this session, but concepts are an important way of expressing contracts. As you will see above, I've now put concepts replacing the whole spin-eye trickery because concepts are a, much, are a new mechanism in the language that much more cleanly allow us to describe constraints on the operations that we're trying to document. When we, writing our templates. In general, the, the syntax is clearer and simpler than the last finite tricks because it doesn't have any funny template machinery obfuscating it, and we've got a much more direct vocabulary once we start defining our concepts to spell this out, so it reads far more cleanly. And it also provides much, certain concept, context where it's much simpler to provide the uh, machinery with concepts, it goes into places that weren't as simple in C++ 19, um, 11. In particular, if I've got a class template and an operation like a constructor, that itself is not a template. It's really hard to set up a spin-eye constraint on that in C++ 11 or even 17, whereas it's really simple, as we're about to see, to drop a requires clause on there in con with concepts and Provide that, implement it, provide that documentation and implementation there. And the other key thing is once we have concepts, we have names to repeatedly use the set of constraints, that opening up vocabulary really simplifies how we talk about our code. So just a couple of simple examples I stole straight out of the standard. This is an illustration of what the syntax looks like defining a concept um, a concept is basically a predicate. Um, when I was trying to you know, define the is same predicate, it turns out it's actually simpler to define it in terms of the type trait, but you've not, having it as a concept it now allows us to drop the same constraints much more easily into the code that follows. Uh, similarly, if we look at my uh, convertible to constraint, it relies on partly the type trait and it also requires that I've got this valid expression that is so not quite, um, asking it, well, especially asking the compiler, does this expression compile the way I expect? So here's an example I was talking about of the kind of code that's really hard to write in C++ um, 17, that's really simple to write with concepts. I've got the pair template, I've got parameters T1 and T2 for the pair, but those are template parameters on the class template. I'm now trying to provide the constructor that takes a const T1 by reference and a const T2 by reference, and the requirement here for this constructor to be valid is I need the elements that I'll be copying into my pair to be copy constructible. Otherwise, I don't want this signature to match at all. And it turns out this is really hard to eliminate with C++ 1117 syntax. It just falls out very easily with the C++ 20 concepts feature. <laughs> 
Uh, here's a simple example of just trying to put up a, a simple notion of using, we can put concept names into the template parameter list, so things fall through from the template. It's a simple syntax example, but it's the notion that a, a lot more can be divined just now from the signature because I'm putting the vocabulary of concepts into the declarations, there's much less burden to describe the nitty gritty of all the operations that come with this now. Just another example that was plaguing, us last, plaguing me last week when we were trying to clean up some parts of the standard for, at, um, in the library working group. We've got this annoying notion that um, if we look at this constructor for vector, it's got a requirement that um, it's an explicit constructor, but it's an explicit constructor potentially in two arguments. And we've had a general attempt to try to clean these up, but what we want to do is now split this up into two constructors so that one just takes the explicit constructor second size type n, and it knows how to handle the, um, the missing allocator by just yeah, passing it through. And the notion is we want to do this just with a delegating constructor and make that a specification. And this cleans up quite nicely once we have you know, the requires clause. First of all, I can have the, the missing requires clause that um, my, my template parameter is default constructable. Yes, because we're making n copies of this default constructed thing. Uh, I do require that the element type in the container is default constructable, otherwise I can't use this constructor. But now when I do the delegating constructor, I end up with a requires requires clause that just says, yeah, um, I'm not going to repeat all the constraints in the constructor I'm delegating to. I'm just going to say, I'm just delegating to that constructor over there, and I require that the same things that work to call it are still valid. So this kind of delegation pattern means you might start seeing a few more requires requires clauses around, but again, it helps simplify a bunch of getting, you know, breaking apart some of these old, old APIs and providing a cleaner, hopefully, attempt to express some of this vocabulary. Final part that we want to come to is the notion that when you start talking about contracts in software, we've got these new attributes coming into C++ that specifically enable checking of the runtime evaluation of contracts. So this is the new analog of the assert macro built into the language, so it, it's passed and hope, hopefully provides us a richer, more useful tool set to reason about these things in the future. So we have an expect attribute to specify preconditions, an ensures attribute to ver verify post conditions, and an assert that can check whatever we want. The difference is the expect and ensures go on the function declaration and are therefore visible to the callers and the compiler. The assert just goes in the function definition, so is not as obvious to the people calling your code. But it helps verify that the English is correct. The interesting thing is what do we do if we fail one of these contract checks? I've not showed you how to write yet, but you know, building up to where we're going. If a contract check fails, we're going to call the system violation handler. And by default, that's just going to call abort. And hopefully write out a bit of information about you know, the file and the line and the expression that failed. But fundamentally, it's going to terminate your process and call abort. abort. But you have the ability using implementation defined means, so not 100% portable, but in principle there's always going to be a way that you can supply your own custom violation handler to be called instead. So you might wish to report or handle violations in some more specific manner. One of the tools we use here at Bloomberg is we turn our accept violations into exceptions so that we can test our code by saying, did you throw the I violated the, accept, the expression you expected me to violate exception. And if that doesn't throw, I know that I don't have my appropriate checks in place. That perhaps not what you want in production is turning precondition violations into exceptions is not necessarily the best answer for 
a production system. So we write that handler, there will be a tool to supply that on the command line. We have no programmatic access to that feature in C20. And that was deemed to be an important feature by folks uh, concerned by security. They don't want to have the ability to have, we've got this wonderful tool to help that we're being caught out of contract. And if that's now a callback that can be subverted by a hostile attacker, that's a really bad thing to put into our code. So we do not want this to be inspectable and changeable at runtime by a hostile attacker. So it's completely a build time artifact. And once it's in, it's in. There's an additional assumption that your violation handler is either going to terminate and turn the process down or it's not going to return by a regular control flow, so it might throw an exception. A second switch says, well, we'll actually allow the, the check to do its, whatever it said it was going to do, and then continue running the program into our potentially undefined behavior. Why would we ever want this? Well, if I'm trying to apply this new contract facility onto an existing live system, I'm concerned that my system that I've not run against these contract checks might start failing and crashing and dying horribly. I want to have some notion of the impact that this change will have. So I install a violation handler that simply logs, hopefully with some kind of exponential back off in case it hits something in a fast loop, and then returns and allows the program to do what it's always been doing, because this is a live system that's been in production for years. And that gives me a chance to audit my system before I actually deploy into production code that actually uses such checks in the future. The other thing that comes as an element, a dimension of our um, ability to control how we check the code, is we have the notion of build modes. If we think back to standard C assert, we've got the disabled mode where checks simply don't run. And what I've called the default mode, that says, yeah, we're gonna run the checks you told me to check. But we're also allowing for a more expensive audit mode, which says, you know, some checks might be so expensive that even in a regular bill, I don't want to run them. I might be having you know, a, a function like uh, find me the median. If my precondition is the whole range is sorted, my testing the precondition is far more expensive than running the function. So I really don't want to have that by default. But in an audit mode, if I'm having some really awkward problems I'm trying to find, having the ability to turn on those more expensive checks that I can mark as expensive turns out to be really useful. Which takes us to the other side. How do we annotate these attributes to say, well, this is the, check, the level I want you to check at? And these, again, come with three flavors. The default is what you get if you say nothing, but if you want to say it, you can spell it, default. Um, the audit is how I say, this is going to be one of those expensive checks that I do not want to run unless I request that I run the expensive checks. And finally, we have the notion of an axiom. And an axiom is a check that there is no way to turn on for runtime evaluation in the compiler. So what use is that? Well, it turns out to be incredibly useful for static analysis tools and other reasoning systems that might know the contract of the function that you're saying you're calling, which you might never actually define. It just needs to be a signature with a contract that has certain properties that says, yeah, that's a valid pointer. I have no, no notion of how I'm going to implement a generic perfect is valid pointer function portably, but I can have an API that says, yeah, Here's for an axiom, I'm asserting that pointer is valid, and people now know how to reason about this, and that can lead into reasoning tools for, say, static analysis tools and so forth. But the key thing is, because we're now no longer dealing with macros, but features built into the language, regardless of the build mode, all of these attributes now must pass correctly, and I believe that includes passing name lookup, because I need to go find my is pointer to have my notion of what that contract was. So, quick example, um, using the expects attribute. So expects, as we expect, is an attribute that says this is the precondition that must be satisfied before you call my function. So here I've got a typical smart pointer dereference. 
returns T reference, my point of operator star const, expects that my data member, M and the putter, is not null. And yeah, my function is no except. And because my function is no except, the question now arises, say I did my wonderful testing thing, I've installed my throwing violation handler. If this function triggers the assert check, and that assert check throws, is it going to throw before or after I've entered the protection of the no except? And to keep things simple and easy to reason about, the rule is simply that if I've got a function mark no except and something throws, even if it's one of these checks, I'm going to terminate. So hopefully that stays simple and easy to reason about. Uh, an example of using some of the um, further attribute syntax for the um, audit and axiom, you can see this is where they drop into the, uh, the syntax for do my median is sorted, is something I'd want running at an audit level because that's quite expensive. But a generic, you know, is this a valid range? And knowing I've got two valid pointers is not something I can ever really expect true runtime code to evaluate and give me a correct answer for. But it is something I would still like to assert with an axiom. So only at the other end, we have the ensures, which is how to provide the post conditions. So, boom, what have I got here? I think I've screwed up my example because I'm looking at min and I'm seeing something that looks like the, pre, the post condition for sorted. So yeah, bad slide. Um, we'll jump down to sort first because I've got that one. Um, once I've sorted my data, again, I'm going, going to want to be able to check the data as we were talking in the earlier session in a sorted state. That's a, a linear cost operation. I might not want to run that by default because even though it's n log n to sort, providing the additional n might still be deemed problematic. So I'll leave that at the audit level and that's where audit goes in the syntax. Um, I forgot what I was trying to with that in, in there. Uh. Um, and it does bring up the other key example that I didn't put an example up for, which is unfortunate. Um, we can also provide ensures clauses. We give them a name that can hold the result to say, is the result what I expected? And that result might want to compare to say with a min, I'm comparing my results with the left and the, you know, the RHS and the OHS. It's got to be one of those and it's got to be the least of those. Um, the question is, what happens if the function modifies the inputs? Because what I would really like for the sort algorithm is to be able to say that as a post condition that my sequence is a permutation of the input. But once I've sorted them, I have no ability to recover the original input to get that permutation. When I've got something like the min function where I've just got a reference to two objects, I can actually directly compare them still. But if they've changed, my post condition could say, I'm expecting I gave you the minimum value that came in, or it could be expressed in the post condition that you changed in the way I expected. So when I pr refer to a variable, do I expect it to be the, the, the value that was there on input or the value that was there on at when the function exited? And it turns out that's a really hard problem to solve without producing far more complicated syntax than we wanted to get into at this point in the language. So the answer is it's undefined behavior if you have a post condition that depends or, or whose result would change if those values have changed. They're not allowed to change during the execution of a function if you have a post condition that relies on them. And I can see that my time is up. So I'll quickly jump down to, oops. I had a quick summary slide, which has gone missing. So contracts are essentially the guarantees that we write in English, but people are going to be able to make assumptions from the code as I was describing it. You want to be clear to your callers which 
aspects of those contracts they can rely on and which they can't, which might just mean upfront documentation for your project as a whole. What, what does it mean to pass a null pointer? But that boundary between those expectations is also your freedom to evolve code in the future. So don't commit to more in the code than you want to actually be a reasonable assumption of your clients. And I'm thinking about things like putting no except here. And with that, I'm gonna close up. If there's any questions, uh, I'll be here to answer them as we wait for, is there another session after this? Hmm? 30 minute break, so I'm happy to sit here and take questions in the meantime. So you might want to, yeah, stay here for a second because what I'm about to ask is exactly what to do with what you were saying. But um, so I'm giving a talk on Wednesday about unit testing, exception safety, and talk. We have a lot of overlap in what we're talking about. And one of the things, this is, I guess, more of a, a comment towards Axiom and just kind of asking your thoughts about this. But one of the ways that, one of the reasons, like a lot of things you would mark Axiom or Axiom is because you might need to have, as uh, as you were saying, like undefined behavior in order to actually check it. And one of the things that you can do is like you may be able to to like write up in your test build something like for is valid range is just like iterate over the range and make sure that you run your binary with ASAN and then it yells at you if you're doing something weird and at least now you have some trace of it as opposed to like some you know undefined behavior that's just waiting to bite you a month from now. You know, like is that like is that sort of like checking like kind of part of the idea of what was behind contracts? Well, I miss probably some of the, one of the other things I should have mentioned about the uh, contract checking annotations is there's a fundamental assumption that they're effectively pure functions, they're not allowed to change state, that's a bad thing, and we assume they're always well-defined behavior. Uh, as you say, you might, you might have your contract check for some defined behavior, so if you were to run it at a different level, of, declare it as something other than an axiom if you wanted to force that as an early check and rely on some UB sand type tool finding that invalidation for you. But if I understand your, where your question is. Well, I mean, I mean, obviously you wouldn't put axiom because you'd want it to run, but I was wondering if like that, that idea of forcing undefined behavior is something that was considered as like when contracts were being thought of. There was a, a wide variety of discussion of where we landed on the axis of undefined behavior as we were going through this. I think I want to catch you offline to find out, I've not quite drilled into the exact point you're asking about, but. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll come talk to you and everyone else is done. I'm almost certain it was discussed, but I'm not sure the exact answer I'm trying to give you, so. Cool, thank you. Uh, so, if, uh, when we are talking about uh, Using contracts in C++, mostly we are talking about a verification of program, but what about using C++ contracts for implementing more optimizations? And optimization our code harder. For example, we can avoid even, uh, uh, the, for example, this uh, to sort call, if we have a post condition is sorted, and exactly after call std sort function, we in caller we check uh, is our input range sorted. We can remove this call function. So, can we use contracts uh, basically for the optimizer to make smarter calls? Um, one of the obvious concerns is if the optimizer can assume that any contract annotation is true. Well, it never needs to check it, therefore it will never actually call the violation handler. So we have to have some interaction at that level. And we would really like the guarantee that um, annotations for checks, even at levels that are not running, cannot invalidate and cause checks that you are running to fail to evaluate. Um, conversely, yes, we do want them to enable optimizations. This has been a clear de desire of getting the feature into the language for there a wide variety of churches trying to say why we want contracts in a language and better support for theorem provers and for optimizers was a distinct part of that. Um, 